We are this morning in Mark chapter 8, and uh, going to be ambitious today and try to look through the first 21 verses of this chapter. And uh, don't get too worried about that. I think we'll be able to move through here in, in, in decent time. But uh, before we, we get into it much further, why don't we read the scripture together? And if you're able, I'd invite you to stand as we read this word. We're in Mark chapter 8, beginning in verse 1. We read in those days when again a great crowd had gathered and they had nothing to eat. He called his disciples to him and said to them, I have compassion on the crowd because they have been with me now three days and have nothing to eat. And if I send them away hungry to their homes, they will faint on the way. And some of them have come from far away. And his disciples answered him, how can one feed these people with bread here in this desolate place? And he asked them, how many loaves do you have? And they said, seven. And he directed the crowd to sit down on the ground. And he took the seven loaves, and having given thanks, he broke them and gave them to his disciples to set before the people. And they set them before the crowd. And they had a few small fish. And having blessed them, he said that these also should be set before them. And they ate and were satisfied. And they took up the broken pieces left over, seven baskets full. And there were about 4,000 people, and then, he sent them, and then he sent them away. And immediately he got into the boat with his disciples and went to the district of Dalmanutha. The Pharisees came and began to argue with him, seeking from him a sign from heaven to test him. And he sighed deeply in his spirit and said, Why does this generation seek a sign? Truly I say to you, no sign will be given to this generation. And he left them, got into the boat again, and went to the other side. Now, they had forgotten to bring bread, and they had only one loaf with them in the boat. And he cautioned them, saying, Watch out! Beware of the leaven of the Pharisees and the leaven of Herod. And they began discussing with one another the fact that they had no bread. And Jesus, aware of this, said to them, Why are you discussing the fact that you have no bread? Do you not yet perceive or understand? Are your hearts hardened? Having eyes, do you not see? And having ears, do you not hear? And do you not remember? When I broke the five loaves for the 5,000, how many baskets full of broken pieces did you take up? And they said to him, 12. And the seven for the 4,000, how many baskets full of broken pieces did you take up? And they said to him, seven. And he said to them, do you not yet understand? We'll stop there. You can be seated. Father, we pray that you would help us this morning to understand. God, as we look to your word, would you, would you guide us and uh, just give us wisdom and uh, strength to be able to uh, go through this study together, uh, to not be distracted or drawn away by other things, but to give your word the attention that it deserves and to allow it to do its work. We pray that uh, as we gather and worship today that you would be with Candy and with her family as they mourn the loss of her grandmother, that you would uh, just be merciful there and that you would give them uh, just comfort and rest, uh, that they would find hope in you and uh, that they would be surrounded by the love of your people. And God, help us to be able to be faithful in our ministry to them and our service to them. And God, I just pray that uh, you get glory even in difficult days. Help us as we go forward in our study now. Guide us, teach us, change us, we pray. In Christ's name, amen. So last week we found Jesus in the region of the Decapolis, those 10 cities under the Roman rule. And he was continuing there an ongoing ministry that he was doing among the Gentiles. Uh, crowds of people gathered around coming to hear him teach. Many brought to him for the purpose of receiving some sort of miraculous healing or deliverance. Uh, we read from Matthew's gospel last week that great crowds came to him, bringing with them the lame, the blind, the crippled, the mute, and many others, and they put him at his feet, and he healed them, so that the crowd wondered when they saw the mute speaking, the crippled healthy, the lame walking, and the blind seeing, and they glorified, we're told, the God of Israel. This is in pagan territory among people who would have worshipped many other gods, and yet they heard about this man named Jesus who had power. Power like they didn't know, like they had never uh, experienced before. They likely had heard about Jesus from that man who had been delivered from demonic oppression 
And though they had worshipped many gods, perhaps none more than they worshipped themselves when they met Jesus. We see that everything changes. They, they are glorifying, by the time this is done, the God of Israel. So these people are, are, are hearing the truth of the gospel, and they're seeing the power of the gospel and the power of Christ as he's working many miracles. And we have a picture here of the hearts of the nations being one uh, to Christ. And so this trip has been a, a sort of a search and rescue mission as Jesus has gone into Gentile territory, calling people to believe in him. And there's this interesting distinction that we see as all this is going on because as Jesus has been ministering and doing and many of these same things among the Jews, he's been met with a whole lot of resistance and resentment and anger and even threats of death. But here, ministering among the, Jew, the Gentiles here, what do we see? They're glorifying the God of Israel. So Jesus is preaching the gospel. He's teaching them uh, the, the truth of the gospel. He's uh, strengthening his disciples, teaching them as well as he's giving them a glimpse of what their own future ministries are going to hold when they're sent out, empowered by the Holy Spirit, to take the gospel to the nations. And so as we continue in our passage this morning, uh, it's a bit longer text than we're maybe used to handling here, and you can see that if your Bible breaks things down into sections, as most of our modern translations do, there's a few different topics that come up here. But we're going to work our way through this, Lord willing, and uh, break some of these things down. But we see this playing out here in kind of three different, uh, different parts here. We begin with this miracle that's given to the Gentiles here, this miraculous feeding. Then we're going to go across the lake. And we're going to meet the Pharisees, and there's going to be a demand that comes from them that Jesus works some kind of sign. And then we're going to have a warning that's given to these disciples as they're back on the boat, heading back across the lake again, as Jesus is teaching his disciples and, and really giving them warning of, of the danger of, of a hard heart, of failing to, um, to embrace the, the hope of salvation that they've been giving. I think it's so fitting as we're coming through this stuff in the Gospel of the Mark, the things we've been dealing with in Hebrews, we're, we're seeing many of these same questions arise, and hopefully you'll see that as we go forward. But we begin here at the beginning of this chapter with this miraculous feeding that's given here among the Gentiles. And so we read that together, and, and if, you, if you're paying attention as we read this, this is a miracle that seems somewhat familiar. It has not been that long ago, just a couple of chapters back, that we saw a similar miracle that took place. But being, be mindful here, Jesus and his disciples are still in the region of the Decapolis, these ten cities. They're ministering among these Gentile people. And, and then we see this miraculous feeding that begins to unfold. Back in chapter 6, we saw a similar feeding among a Jewish crowd who had followed Jesus and the disciples when they had tried to slip away uh, for some time alone. But rather than turning them away, Jesus that day had compassion on them. He spent the day teaching them, and he fed them before he would send them back to their homes. And here in chapter 8, we find a very Gentile crowd in a different place. And Jesus also is going to work a similar miracle among them, feeding them before he sends them on their way. Now, the similarities between these two events are, are, are many. Um, large crowds gathered in the wilderness, coming to be near Jesus, to hear him teach, to be able to witness his miracles and perhaps receive those miracles for themselves. We see that happening in both of these cases. We have people who are gathered far away from any sufficient supply of food that would have been able to provide for their needs, and you find that the people are unprepared. They don't have what they need to feed themselves. We see in each case that Jesus has compassion on the crowd because of their hunger and because of their distance from home, and so he, he, he's going to set out to take care of them. We see in each case that he proposes to his disciples that they ought to be making preparations to be able to care for these people. Jesus, in both cases, asks what food is available, and they come up with some loaves and some fish. Jesus seats the crowds. He multiplies the, foods. He, uh, the food. He feeds them until they are all satisfied and full. And you see in both of these cases that leftovers are gathered into baskets and then the crowds are sent away and Jesus' disciples end up getting in a boat to go on to their next destination. A lot of similarities here. So similar, in fact, that some people have determined that there must be some mistake here. 
that this must be the, the same event. And maybe Mark's writing this gospel record and he, he, he writes it once and he's going along and he thinks, oh, wait, let me write about this thing. And then he goes back and writes it again, except for this time, maybe some of the details are a little fuzzy, but nonetheless, he gets the point across. Some people insist this must be the same thing. But while we can't blame people for seeing the similarities, because they are many, we need to be careful also that we don't miss the differences. As I've already said, these, these feedings took place in different locations. The first took place in the, the area of Bethsaida, uh, whereas this takes place on the other side of the lake, at the Decapolis, those ten cities. The first feeding was for an exclusively Jewish audience, and the second feeding was for a predominantly Gentile audience. In the first account, we read that Jesus had been the pe- with the people all day, teaching them. And now we're, we're told here that these Gentiles had been with Jesus for three days. So while the first group may have come completely unprepared, maybe this group had some food in the beginning, but it's long gone because they've been with the Lord for three days now. In the first account, we t- we're told that there were five loaves and two fish. In the second account, we read that there were seven loaves and a few fish. In the first account, we're told that there were 12 baskets left over when everyone had eaten their fill, while in this second account, there are seven baskets. You actually won't see this in an English reading, and this was interesting and new to me. Uh, The the word that's used to describe those baskets is even different in each of those cases. The, The baskets, the 12 baskets full mentioned in the first feeding were smaller baskets, a picnic basket that a family might take along, whereas the baskets that are referenced here in Mark's gospel are big, huge, like storage kind of baskets that you would use to carry things. That's the same word that's used when they put Paul in a basket and they lowered him over the wall so he could escape. It's a, it's a big man-sized basket that you could put a person in, and so there's a distinction even in language there. Even with the fish, there's something like that. Uh, specifically mentioned in Mark chapter 8, these were sardines, uh, if, you, if you read the language there, whereas just generically a word used for fish is in the first account. Uh, small issues, but, but, but differences none the same here. In the first account, we read that there were 5,000 men alone, plus the women and children who would have accompanied them. In the second account, we read about 4,000 people who were gathered here. In the first account, Jesus sent his disciples away in a boat while he went up to the mountainside to pray. But in the second account, Jesus gets in the boat with his disciples and they sail off together to a specific destination. So, you know, there are a number of differences in these two accounts if you're paying attention. And just in case you still might find yourself being a little bit skeptical, you'll see as you read forward in this chapter, when Jesus is speaking to his disciples, he specifically mentions these as different events. Hey, do you remember when we fed the 5,000? And what did I do there? And what was left over? Do you remember when I fed the 4,000? And what was left over there? So Jesus himself drawing the distinction. So some really want to push very hard to say that these two are one and the same, but clearly these things are different, and Jesus makes that clear, if nothing else does. It is worth mentioning again, though, that this miraculous feeding that we find in Mark chapter 8 was done primarily for a Gentile audience. And I know we've mentioned this over the last couple of weeks, but I think we're just reminded here again uh, of the reach of the gospel that transcends any particular time or place or particular culture or people group. This is something that extends to the nations, to the ends of the earth. It was was God's plan all along to reach the nations with the hope of the gospel. So that first feeding of the 5,000 on that hillside near Bethsaida came after a series of miraculous works that were done among the Jews Uh, alongside the preaching of the gospel. And and we saw in John chapter 6, when some discussion about this began to unfold, that he said, look, the the, the lesson I'm trying to teach you through this, I don't want to just give you physical bread. I'm telling you that you ought to seek after spiritual bread. You ought to be looking for the bread of life that will feed you forever. And that's going to come through me, Jesus says. I'm the bread of life. I'm the one that can satisfy you forever. And so as he's doing these feedings, he's doing it in the hopes of reaching these people with the message of the gospel. He wants them to believe. And we have to know that the same is true here among these Gentiles. When Jesus comes teaching and working miracles, and even as he works this great miracle and feeds the masses, the real hope is that they would know the bread of life and that they would feast from the one who would satisfy their souls forever. And so we just want to bear in mind, there is a picture of this gospel that goes everywhere to every one. And so, you know, this is not something that's meant to be held back. You think given the disciples' backgrounds that they might have been uncomfortable with this whole trip through this Gentile territory. And when they sit down and Jesus is about to feed these crowds, you, you got to think maybe there's something in their minds that would say, Lord, I, I know, I, I know. 
You, you, you did this for the Jews, but you're going to do it for these people too? I, I know I'm, I'm, I'm leaning a little bit here, but, but I think knowing what we know about the culture, I, I'm sure this would have been a struggle. And that's why I think this whole uh, se- sequence of ministry that Jesus has done traveling through this Gentile territory is so important because he's preparing his disciples for things that are yet to come. You know, if you read the book of Acts, that after the Lord ascended into heaven and he sent his spirit and he empowered his people and he sent them out to do this work and he told them, you're going to be my witnesses in Jerusalem and all Judea and Samaria to the ends of the earth, that still they were reluctant to do that in some cases. And as the gospel went to the Gentiles and they received the spirit and they're being embraced in the church, there were people in Jerusalem and said, hey, no way, there's a problem here. The church had to deal with this. And I think it's so important that Jesus is doing this work to prepare them for that and to show the the global impact of this gospel. And so I think it's important that we take note of that because we can be a lot like those Hebrews sometimes. We can live in our nice, comfortable American bubble where, hey, we're a Christian nation and everything's great and we're the people that honor the Lord and God's going to be pleased with us, which is so bogus in its own right. But we can begin to think that, hey, the gospel is here and it's good for us. But we don't need to take it over there because those people are different. Those people, they, they worship other gods. They, they do this. They do that. Maybe we don't need to take this over there. Don't let yourself get caught up in that kind of mindset. I've seen it too many times. This gospel is meant to go to everyone in every place. Now, apart from that, there's not much more I feel like we need to say about this particular miracle As Jesus had done in the first feeding, he demonstrated his love for the people as he feeds this hungry crowd. He wasn't going to have them going off to their homes with no food in their bellies and some of them traveling a long distance. He's he's concerned with them. He has compassion for them. They may faint along the way because they're going to be weak. He doesn't want any harm to come to them, so he demonstrates his power and his glory as he multiplies the loaves and the fish and as he feeds the crowd. And he shows himself in this to be the Savior the one and only. The gospel is being confirmed by his miracles. No one but Messiah could do the things that Jesus did. But you have this this miracle that's given to the Gentiles here, just as it's been given to the Jews. Well, after that's over and the crowds are sent away, you see in verse 10 that immediately he, Jesus, gets into the boat with his disciples and went to the district of Dalmanutha. And there we're going to have an encounter that unfolds again with these Jewish religious leaders in a a confrontation with the Pharisees and the demand for a sign. It says in the ESV that they got in their boat, they went to the district of Dalmanutha. If you read in Matthew's gospel, it actually says that they went to the region of Magadan. And so um, some people would look at that and say, hey, there's a problem here. You don't need to be concerned that much because the district of Dalmanutha was located in the region of Magadan. You could say, we're going to Lincoln County, or we're going to Moreland. And guess what? You're ultimately going to the same place. You're not going to be too worried about here, right? So this is an area that's located on the western shore of the Sea of Galilee, not far from Capernaum. And so this means that after this feeding of the 4,000, Jesus' ministry through Gentile territory kind of comes to an end. They're back among the Jews. But it doesn't take long at all. As soon as they step back into Jewish territory... And Jesus comes in, and the crowds, no doubt, are gathered, and all these things that unfold everywhere Jesus goes. It doesn't take long before they're confronted again by their religious leaders. Verse 11 says that the Pharisees came and began to argue with him, seeking from him a sign from heaven to test him. So these religious leaders constantly looking for ways to discredit Jesus, to somehow undermine his ministry. They're looking for ways to to turn people away from him, to find a cause perhaps to convict him. And once again, they come here with their accusations against Jesus. They're arguing with him. They're challenging him. And they demand at this point that Jesus give them a sign. But not just any sign. They want a sign from heaven. Now, given what we know about Jesus' ministry in this region and all the things that these religious leaders undoubtedly would have seen Jesus do already with their own eyes, you can imagine how disingenuous it is for them to come and to ask him for this sign. It does say there that they asked for this sign in order to test him. They were looking for some way to to catch him, to make him trip up, to make him do something that they could use to convict him, or perhaps they thought, oh, he won't be able to do it. And then we'll be able to tell everybody these are fraud. But they come demanding this sign from heaven. The reality is that these men had already seen many, many signs 
It was abundantly clear. They had seen many signs. Everywhere that Jesus went, and he's teaching the gospel, there are always miracles that tend to accompany that. And so we've, we've talked about so much of that along the way. We've seen those miracles unfolding in the pages of the gospel. The lame walk, the deaf hear, the mute speak, the blind see, the sick and the diseased are being healed. Those who are oppressed by demons are being rescued from their bondage. Even the dead are being given life. You've got this miraculous feeding that we saw in chapter 6. It's been replicated here in chapter 8 among the Gentiles where Jesus has demonstrated his power over nature and matter and just multiplying these loaves and turning them into something great. There had been no shortage of miraculous signs in the public ministry of of Jesus. And these these leaders, they were well, well aware of it all. They couldn't refute Jesus' power, Jesus' authority. They couldn't refute the things that he had done. The only thing that they'd been able to do up to this point, and you'll remember this, was to accuse him of doing his mighty works, not by the power of God, but by the power of another. Hey, sure, he's doing some great stuff, but you know what? It's not from God. This comes from the devil. They, they accused him of doing these things by the power of Beelzebub. And so they're, 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 that's the only thing they've been able to do is to try to discredit him by kind of reappropriating his power. And Jesus rightly pointed out in that moment that they were blaspheming God and that they were in danger of crossing the line in a way that they would never come back from and they would would enter eternal hell. So the simple reality is that the hearts of these religious leaders, they were hard as stone. These men were completely uninterested in anything that would come from Jesus. They had been given many signs, but they would not accept them. Even as they asked for signs from the heavens, do you remember what happened at the Lord's baptism? He, he goes beneath the water. What happens? The heavens open up and there's a booming voice that comes from, a, from above and the, the spirit descends on the Lord Jesus like a dove. They, they've seen this sort of thing already if they're paying attention. But they're demanding a sign that they have no intention of accepting. They're just looking for anything else they can use to try to condemn the Lord Jesus. Now, what's interesting in my reading that it's, it's not insignificant that they would ask for a sign from heaven or in the heavens because there was a common Jewish superstition that the demons were able to do miraculous works on the earth. There, there were things that they could do that were tangible to the people here, but only God could do a miracle in the heavens. And so they thought that somehow, whether this happened on the land or in the skies, that there would be some sort of distinction And they've already accused Jesus of doing the devil's work in order to see, so this is their test. Jesus, you do something really big. You you, you write a message in the skies, or you, you rain down fire from heaven. You prove somehow that you've really come from God. And again, they're saying this not because they want to believe in him. They're arguing with him. They're demanding this sign from heaven so that they can test him. They're looking for another way to bring him down. And so even if Jesus were to do such a thing, we can be sure that they would not believe. And Jesus had not come to do tricks for them on demand. He wasn't beholden to them to use his power to somehow try to convince them in any particular way. He had not come to perform miracles for people who had no interest in receiving them and would only use them against him. They had no right to make these demands. And maybe as we're thinking about that, it's, it's worth considering our, our own lives and our own thoughts and sometimes, and those times we may think, God, you, you, you owe me something. You need to do something for me. God, you really need to make this thing happen. Or maybe at times when we're struggling with doubt and we would say, you know, God, you really need to sort this out. Why don't you show me something right now? It's the least you could do. Listen, God is not beholden to our demands. He doesn't owe us these sorts of things. He certainly does not owe this to these Pharisees. And they're not going to get the kind of sign that they're looking for. So they come making this demand. Give us a sign in the heavens. They're looking for a way to further test him. And verse 12 tells us that he sighed deeply in his spirit. Like what we saw last week with this healing of this man who was deaf and mute. There's a sigh here, a deep sigh of anguish. A sigh that likely could be seen and heard that reflected this groaning from deep within. Jesus is is heartbroken, he's angry at the spiritual blindness, the deliberate hardness of heart that he sees in these religious leaders. He knows that condemnation is coming for them. And so there's there's a bit of a lament 
mixed in with some anger as he sighs deeply in his soul. But then he says to them, why? Why does this generation seek a sign? Truly, I say to you, no sign will be given to this generation. And when you read Matthew's gospel, if you're familiar with that passage, you may be thinking, hey, there's a little bit more to this, and you're right. Matthew gives us a little more detail on the way Jesus responds to them. He, he says to them first, after they demand a sign, he says, hey, when it's evening, you say, it will be fair weather, for the sky is red. And in the morning, it will be stormy today, for the sky is red and threatening. Perhaps you're familiar with that saying, red sky by night, sailor's delight, red sky by morning, sailor take warning. These Pharisees and, and, and Sadducees that Matthew mentions, are there with them? They, they, they probably didn't use that nice little rhyme. But nonetheless, Jesus says, hey, look, you, you, you know how to interpret the signs around you. you. You can take a look at the weather patterns and know what's going to come. You, you can watch the skies. And he says to them, you know how to interpret the appearance of the skies. But this is what he says. You cannot interpret the signs of the times. He's indicting them here. He says, look, you, know, you, you can look at the sky and you get a good idea about the weather, but you see these things happening all around you and you act like you got nothing. What's going on here? You think, you think about, remember, we talked about this last week even, John the Baptist, right? His followers come to Jesus and they say, hey, are you the one we're waiting for? Should we be waiting for another? And Jesus says to them, well, go back and tell them what you're seeing all around you. The blind see, the lame walk, the deaf hear. Poor having the gospel preached to them. These are the things that are happening. And he's going back to prophecies about the Messiah. And when the Messiah comes, these things are going to happen. He says, go tell them. Prophecies being fulfilled right here in my ministry. Well, these folks have been witness to the same things. They knew the words of the prophets. They knew what the Messiah was going to say and do. They'd been watching and waiting. And then Jesus comes and he does exactly those things. Everything that had been promised about this Messiah who's going to come, Jesus comes, fulfills those prophecies, keeps those promises. And they could not bring themselves to accept him for who he clearly was. This is their great shortcoming. That he says, look, you, you can look at the weather and you know whether you ought to go out on the sea or not. But this means nothing to you. All this stuff that you've been witness to, act like you don't have a clue. Something's wrong. And so he tells them again in Matthew's account here. He says it's an evil and adulterous generation that seeks for a sign. I think he's specifically honing in the fact that, look, you've been given plenty, but you're just begging for more. And no matter what I give you, you're not going to care anyway. Evil and adulterous generation, they have no interest in the things of God. But he says this to them, no sign's going to be given to it, except, y'all remember what this one was? It's the sign of Jonah, he says. So the wickedness of their hearts is being revealed in these demands for something greater than what has already been exceedingly shown to them. It's a demonstration here of their sin and their disobedience. They're not going to accept God's messenger, though they had plenty to go on. But they're not going to be given anything else. There's not going to be a sign in the heavens. But he did say, you're going to see one thing. It's going to be the sign of Jonah. You know the story of Jonah? Jonah? What happened? He runs from the Lord. He's disobeying. Gets on a ship and goes the opposite direction of where God's sending him. But a storm comes and he's cast into the sea, but he's swallowed up by this great fish, right? And he spends three days in the belly of this great fish and then he spit out on the shore and he goes to the people and he takes the message he was meant to take all along. Symbolically, Jonah went to his death, but he was returned to life. And Jesus says, you want a sign? I'll give you a sign. Remember Jonah. Because one day this body's going into the grave, but it's not going to stay there. And when the resurrected Christ stands before you in judgment, you're going to figure it out real quick. That's going to be their sign. No greater sign of Jesus' divine glory, his ultimate power, the fact that he has come from God. And in that moment when that takes place, these religious leaders will see, but they still won't comprehend. At least not until they stand before him in final judgment. But Matthew gives us this, this sign of Jonah. It's interesting that Mark 
leaves that out, and I think there probably is a reason for that. Matthew is writing primarily to a Jewish audience. And Mark is writing to Gentiles. The story of Jonah wouldn't have meant much to them. They wouldn't have given it much thought. They, they may probably have never even heard of him because he wasn't a part of their traditions. And so he didn't need to say it. Regardless, Jesus gives these Pharisees their rebuke, these Sadducees that were with them. He calls them wicked and adulterous. He says, you're not going to get a sign today in the heavens, but you're going to see. And with his death and his burial and his resurrection, he will prove beyond any shadow of doubt that he is the one who has come from God. Now with that, we're told that Jesus and his disciples departed from them. It says in verse 13 that he left them, got on the boat again, and went to the other side. From this point forward, things are going to change. There, there's a turning point that happens here as you read through the Gospels, and you're going to see that the way that Jesus ministers to the people in that region is not going to be like it was. John MacArthur sums it up this way. He says, from this point forward, the Lord's miracles, like his parables, would be primarily intended for his disciples. No longer for the religious leaders or even for the crowds. And moreover, his public ministry in Galilee comes to its end. When he later made a trip through the region, he did so secretly. And the populace of Galilee that had been given ample opportunity to repent and believe but did not, would not hear that call from him again. Having finally been rejected by them, he shifts his focus to Judea and to Jerusalem and ultimately to the cross. It's a really sad picture when you think about it. Jesus gets into his boat and he sails away. And it's almost as if this is, this is kind of a last straw. You've been given every mercy, you've been given every opportunity, and you've, you've refused to hear these words and to believe. And at least in terms of what we read in the Gospels, ministry in this area and among these people, it's not going to be the same. A group of people who are hard-hearted to the end, who seal their own condemnation by their irrational unbelief. And it was. In light of all that Jesus done, it's absolutely irrational. And it ought to break our hearts to see this kind of blindness to the truth, to know the judgment that comes from it. Because we, we see it in the scriptures, but we also see it all around us. People who so clearly ought to see and know and understand these truths of the gospel because they've seen God's mercy unfold all around them and in their own lives over and over again, and yet they don't believe. And so it's heartbreaking. But I think there also ought to be a warning here for us because we too can be at risk here of doing what the Pharisees do, of going to Jesus for the things that we want him to do, the things we want him to give us, to make our demands and expect him to perform according to our own expectations. We can be just like them, trusting in our own self-righteousness and missing out on the grace of God that is available in Jesus Christ. If we become like them and convince ourselves that we can be good enough on our own, that we don't need Jesus to cleanse us from sin, we'll be no better off. And if we think he exists just to give us what we ask for and to submit himself to our demands, we will miss the point. These Jews had built their religion on a Messiah who was promised would come. But when he came, they wanted nothing to do with him. And still to this day, they're saying, no, we want another. We want another. We're, we're waiting for another Messiah, a Messiah like we expect, like we want to have. And they're waiting in vain. And someday they're going to see him revealed in his glory, having died and been buried and been raised and now seated in majesty and glory. But when they see him then, it's going to be too late. And we can look at those Jews and say, man, you've, you've missed your Messiah. Do you, do you realize it's possible for you to be living in a Christian environment, to be a part of a Christian church, to be in a Christian family, in a Christian nation, and to miss Christ? Do you know you can do that? These folks, they knew all about the Messiah, but when he comes, they, they, they miss it. You can hear all about Jesus, but never know him. We are not immune to this. 
and we are not immune to eternity in hell if we miss out on God's grace through the gospel. And I think that's, that's part of the reason that we get this, this next section that kind of flows out of this as Jesus speaks to his disciples. Because we're going to see here a warning that's given to them. Uh, these people have been with Jesus in his ministry. They've, they've gone with him throughout all of this. They've been witnesses to his miracles. Jesus calls them, says, follow me, and they come. And Jesus tells them, you're in danger. You pick up there in verse 14 with Jesus and his disciples. They're back in this boat. They're headed to their next, de de next destination. And we find out that in their haste to depart from Galilee and to leave these Pharisees and Sadducees behind, that they've forgotten to bring their food. So they have with them in the boat only one loaf of bread. And they're headed to an isolated place on the other side of the sea where food's not going to be readily available. And it becomes clear as this passage unfolds that they're concerned about that. What are we going to do? They're worried about food. But Jesus is focused on other things. And so they realize they only have one loaf of bread in the boat, and Jesus doesn't address that. But what does he say in verse 15? It says he cautioned them, saying, Watch out. Beware of the leaven of the Pharisees and the leaven of Herod. Now, most of you probably understand how leaven works. You, you, you do some baking and you take some yeast and you get a little warm water and you mix that in and you start this reaction. You put that in and that will work its way through and that's how you're going to get your bread to rise and do all these sorts of things. These people would have understood that as well. And the idea here is that, that yeast is kind of a picture of influence. It's something that works its way through and it, it, it gets, into, gets into everything, right? And so a, a little bit of yeast can work its way through a big batch of dough, and before you know it, none of it can be preserved. In the Bible, yeast is often used as a, a symbol of influence, but, but mostly the corrupting influence of sin. Just a little bit can grow and spread and cause a whole lot of damage. And so Jesus is warning his disciples here, watch out, beware the leaven of the Pharisees and of Herod. Do not let their corrupting influence shipwreck your own faith. Trying to understand this, I think the leaven of the Pharisees and the leaven of Herod are, are basically two sides of the same coin. The Pharisees are legalists on the one hand. They, they thought that by abiding by a strict set of rules and regulations, by avoiding the temptations of the world, that they would be able to guarantee their place in heaven. They thought they could be good enough to earn God's favor under the law. So they're the legalists of the bunch. They're given over to the law and think somehow they can master it. You have the Herodians on the other hand who were liberals. Really, they were completely secular. They may have been of some sort of Jewish descent, and they may have ruled in Jewish territory, but they didn't give much thought to Jewish religion. They embraced every form of immorality and idolatry that the world had to offer. They didn't worry about rules and regulations because they didn't expect there would be any consequences for their actions. Matthew adds that the Sadducees were also a part of this warning and the Sadducees were somewhere in the middle. They were religious, but they were rationalist. They didn't accept any religious teaching that they couldn't reconcile with what they themselves believed about the natural world. It's the spirit of the Sadducees, alive and well today. So they didn't believe in angels. They didn't believe in demons. They didn't accept miracles. They didn't believe in the resurrection of the dead. They were Jewish, but they would consider themselves enlightened they thought they knew better but in every case what does all this boil down to these were people who thought they had figured things out on their own that they could make their own way to to satisfy whatever it is they thought they needed to satisfy they became the ultimate authority over themselves and every one of these ideologies in its own way became absolutely destructive and damning. And each of their systems were powerless to save. They could only condemn them. R.C. Sproul summarized it this way. He said, as Jesus is warning his disciples about the leaven of the Pharisees and the Sadducees and of Herod, what's he saying to them? Watch out. 
Watch out for false doctrine. Watch out for hypocrisy. Watch out for unbelief. Because that's the ultimate danger that they face. And I couldn't help, I'm going through this and I'm thinking, here we are in Hebrews. And, and, and we've talked about how Christ is superior over all things. He is the one who is preeminent in all of this. He's the one who gets the glory. And so we better be careful. Because how are we going to escape if we neglect such a great salvation? If we fail to take seriously the commands of Christ? If we don't submit ourselves to his gospel and believe in his word? And just this morning, we talked about the danger of those who would harden their hearts and not be able to enter into the Lord's rest. That's what's happening right here with these Pharisees and these Sadducees and these Herodians. They've hardened their hearts. They're not earning the rest. They're in rebellion against God in all forms. But what was the root problem? We saw it in Sunday school this morning. What ultimately caused them to harden their hearts and rebel and not hear the word of the Lord? Because they didn't believe. And Jesus is saying to his disciples, who he has called out by name, who have left everything behind to come with him, you better be careful you don't end up in the same place. Watch out. And they miss it all. Why? Because all they can think about is a loaf of bread. Jesus says, look, don't fall into the same trap. Watch out. Beware the leaven of the Pharisees and the Herods. And what do we see right after that? They begin discussing with one another the fact that they had no bread. Jesus won't have time for that. We're going to get hungry. How are we going to eat? And Jesus knows what's going on. It's amazing when you think about it. These disciples, had, they've witnessed two miraculous feasts where Jesus takes just a few loaves and fish and he multiplies them and he feeds the masses and they send home a bunch of leftovers when it's done. And yet here are these disciples sitting in a boat, counting heads, we got one loaf of bread. What are we going to do? How are we ever going to make it? Verse 17 says, Jesus, aware of this, says to them, why are you discussing the fact that you have no bread? What's wrong with you people, right? I just get that R.C. Sproul clip there in my head. What's wrong with you people? Why are you discussing the fact that you have no bread? Do you not perceive or understand are your hearts hardened? Having eyes, do you not see? And having ears, do you not hear? And do you not remember? When I broke the five loaves for the 5,000, how many baskets full of pieces did you take up? And they said 12. And the seven for the 4,000, how many baskets full of broken pieces did you take up? And they said to him, seven. They said to them, do you not, do you not yet understand? This, this whole question of bread shouldn't have been the slightest concern for the Lord's disciples. He, he is so clearly able to, to provide for their needs. He's, he's done it for thousands and thousands of people. And he's done it twice. And here you are saying, we're going to be on a hillside in the wilderness and we've only got one loaf. How will we eat? Well, gee, I wonder. It's amazing, you know, that this miracle happens for this Jewish crowd that's gathered, 5,000 men and women and children. And still, when Jesus says we need to feed these people, back at the beginning of the chapter, well, how are we going to do that? We're out here in the middle of nowhere. There's nowhere to get them food. How can one feed these people with bread in this desolate place? Really? Third time's a charm? Nope. We've only got one loaf. How are we going to eat? And when you think about the scale of the Lord's miracles, the, the worry that they had over this loaf, it's, it's silly. And it shows the ongoing weakness of their faith. These are men of the Lord again. I said he's called them by name. They, they followed him. They've seen his teaching. They've seen his miracles in so many ways. They've even taken part in that. Remember, he's already sent them out and they've come back and, hey, we've had a fruitful ministry out here preaching the gospel and working miracles and it's been great. They've seen Jesus deliver countless others. They've seen his care and provision. They've seen him calm the storms and rebuke the seas and save their very lives from destruction and yet, even on the simplest of things, they're still struggling here. It's all quite ridiculous when you think about it, until you start to think about it. Or better put, perhaps, when we start to think about us, when we think about the way that we live our own lives, 
I think we can see pretty quickly how in spite of God's faithfulness that he has demonstrated over and over and over again, how prone are we to doubt, to question, to despair? We make these great confessions of our faith. Oh, we're followers of Jesus. We trust him. We'll sing those songs. Jesus, Jesus, how I trust him, how I proved him, or and or, until something goes wrong. And then what is it? Oh, no. What are we going to do? How are we going to make it? Who could possibly deliver us? Whether it's a major crisis in our lives, or here's the real thing that I think really indicts our hearts. Sometimes those minor inconveniences. Hey, these disciples are in a boat. We only got one loaf of bread. What are we going to do? Listen, worst case scenario, take your boat to the next port. Go find some bread. This isn't the end of the world. But man, the, the, the smallest inconveniences come up. And we fall apart, don't we? We struggle just as they did. Jesus, in some of those moments, I think, says to us, just as he says to his disciples here, do you not yet understand? Beware. Again, if you go to Matthew's gospel, it's in Matthew 16. This rebuke from the Lord goes a little bit further. He says to them in verse 11, how is it that you fail to understand that I do not speak about bread? Hey, I mentioned leaven. I'm not talking about what's in that loaf. Why, why are you caught up on that? That's not the issue here. That's not what I'm talking about. I'm telling you, beware the leaven of the Pharisees and the Sadducees. Jesus is saying, look, you're not listening. You're missing the point here. You're thinking about all the wrong things. Don't you get it? I'm not talking about the stupid loaf of bread. Do you not think I can feed you? We've been down that road. There's a bigger problem here. By God's mercy, we see that they did learn that lesson, though. After this rebuke from the Lord, it's as if they're kind of knocked back a little bit and they have to think about these things. And I think they realize how foolish some of this is because we're told that then they understood that he did not tell them to beware of the leaven of bread, but of the teaching of the Pharisees and the Sadducees. They realized Jesus wasn't talking about, nor was he the least bit worried about, the kind of provisions that they had in their sacks. This wasn't a matter of whether or not they had enough bread to eat during the time in the wilderness. He would take care of that. But he's warning them about the leaven, the false teaching, the false righteousness, the unbelief of the Pharisees and the Sadducees and the Herods. He's warning them about their lack of faith in him, a failure to take in his miracles and to believe that he is able, a failure to trust in him to provide and to save. What they needed to do, Jesus is trying to get through them, is you're going to have to abandon these, these fleshly pursuits and you're going to have to walk by faith. Obey my word, listen to what I've said. And the same is true for us. We need to be mindful of these questions that Jesus speaks to his disciples. And again, just thinking about what we talk about in Hebrews these last few weeks in our small groups. Jesus is talking to people who knew him. People who had been called by name. People who had obeyed that call. Who were partners with him in ministry. Judas set aside. That's a whole different case. He had a purpose too. But these are men who, who know Jesus. Who know his gospel who I think by the power of his word and his spirit are, have been transformed, and yet they're struggling just the same. Now, the way he asked these questions might cause us to wonder, do they really know the Lord? Do you not yet perceive or understand? Are your hearts hardened? Having eyes, do you not see? Having ears, do you not hear? Do you not remember? But I think there's a distinction here between the disciples that Jesus is questioning and those people that he's warning them not to be like. See, the Pharisees, the Sadducees, the Herods, they're, they're all caught up in unbelief. He makes that clear. They do not believe. And so they do not perceive because they cannot. They do not understand because they cannot. Their hearts are hard because there's no other way for them to be. They don't see because they can't see. They don't hear because they can't hear. They don't remember because they've got nothing to remember. Remember. 
They have not received the Lord's mercy in the same way that these men have. But for the disciples, things were different. And that's why I think when Jesus asked these questions, it's a wake-up call that leads to them getting the point. I think we see that what Jesus is asking them, it does its work. Because before it's over, in Matthew's gospel, they get it. So what's Jesus saying? Hey, look, guys, are, are you paying attention? You, you're really going to tell me that you don't understand what's going on here. You're, you're really that worried about that loaf of bread. Are, are you sure that your hearts have been changed? Has the gospel really done its work in you? Have you been watching? Have you been listening? How is it that you're still asking these kinds of questions? Have you forgotten what I've taught you? Have you forgotten all the things that you've been witness to since I've called you? These miracles at every turn. Did I ever leave you uncared for? Have your needs ever gone unmet? Do you think I'm not able? Do you think I'm not enough? I think that's really the heart of these questions that Jesus is throwing at his disciples. And I think he's doing it on purpose because he said, look, you, you, you don't believe the gospel. Pay attention. Don't you see? And, and those questions do their work. And they understand. Why are we fussing about this loaf? Yeah. He's warning us not to be like these guys, not to get swept away in these things, to keep the faith. And I wonder, are there times in your life when the Lord could just as easily be asking you these questions? Because I certainly know in mine, there are times where in one way or another, as I open up the scripture or I go before the Lord in prayer, I hear some of these questions and they sting. It's not fun sometimes, but we need to be reminded. God does it by his mercy, through his word and through his spirit. He does it through his people. That's why one of the things we were told to do in the scripture this morning in Hebrews was to exhort one another. Every day while we wait. God's merciful. And so when the disciples ask these, ask these questions, things click. They do perceive. They do understand. Their hearts are receiving this. They're opened up. They see. They hear. They remember. They get the message. And it changes them. They take another step forward. Just in this walk of faith in Christ. And they're being prepared for the next challenge. And God is merciful to us also. He calls us to be mindful of that mercy as it's been demonstrated throughout human history and as we've seen it in our own lives to know that he is faithful and true and that we can hope in him. And so we can be asked, are you paying attention? Do you perceive? Do you understand? Is your heart really that hard? Can't you see? Can't you hear? Don't you remember? See my faithfulness and understand. James read to us a little bit early, earlier from 2 Peter chapter 3, and that was for a reason. I thought of that passage while I was studying for this sermon. And Peter says there, 2 Peter chapter 3, look, I've written you two letters now. And, and, and this is why I'm writing, because I want you to Remember. I want to stir up your minds. I, I want to remind you of these truths of Christ, these truths of the gospel, the way he's placed his expectations on you. I want you to remember these things because a whole lot of people are scoffing. A whole lot of people are laughing at this whole idea. They don't believe any of it. I'm telling you to hold on to hope. He says, I want you to remember. Well, remember what? Remember the predictions of the holy prophets and the commandments of the Lord and Savior through your apostles. Why? Because these scoffers are going to come. They're going to deny the promises of God that are ours through faith in Christ. But those promises are true. And so I want you to remember and I want you to be changed as a result. Remember these things. Know that the Lord keeps his promises, that he has promised to deliver, and there's an ultimate deliverance that's coming when he returns and judges wickedness and takes us home. And if you believe those things to be true, how does that change you? Well, what kind of life do you live? You live one marked by holiness and godliness. You wait for and hasten the coming day of the Lord. You're diligent to be found in him without spot or blemish. You're at peace. You're holding fast to the hope of salvation. You're not carried away by the error of lawless people. 
You're not losing your stability, but you're standing firm. You're growing in the grace and knowledge of our Lord and Savior, Jesus Christ. You're not neglecting this great salvation. You're not hardening your hearts in unbelief. But you're walking in faith so that you'll enter the rest. Jesus' disciples so easily distracted just as we are. And he says to them, watch out. Beware the leaven of the Pharisees, the leaven of Herod, the leaven of the Sadducees. Don't be swayed by the legalists or the liberals or the skeptics who stand in between them. Remember what the Lord has done. Remember what he's done for you. And keep the faith. Hold fast to his promises. Trust in him. We gather here week in and week out as people who, by and large, are confessing the gospel. Confessing our faith in the Lord Jesus Christ. We believe that he's come into the world. We'll we'll read these miracles and say, yeah, we believe he did those things. and, and, And we believe that he's coming again and he's going to deliver and he's going to save. But boy, when we're tested, we can lose sight real quick, can't we? Jesus says to us, perceive, understand, remember, see, hear, and trust. Let's keep the faith. Let's not neglect our salvation. Let's stand firm so that we can enter the rest. Let's pray together. Father, we thank you again for time together in your word and with these people. We thank you for the opportunity we have just to be able to do this. So many don't have that chance. Prevented by all sorts of circumstances that they face in this life, whether they are people who are sick and shut in, whether there are people who live in difficult places where there's no church for them to go to, people who are following you in faith that don't know a single other believer and are just hoping someday to find someone that they can share with the joy that comes from knowing Christ. We have a great privilege here, but it's a privilege that so often we take for granted. And we can come in here week by week and we can hear all about Christ and sing songs about Christ and pray in the name of Christ and share in all this sweet fellowship And God, if we're not careful, we can still miss Christ. So I pray that you would help us not to do that. That we would hear these words and that we would take them to heart. That you would work in your spirit to convince us of these things. And and God, uh, first first and foremost, just to transform us by your gospel and bring us into your family. And for those of us who confess your name, God, would you help us to remember, to understand Not to lose sight of your mercies, but to stand in your mercies, to rest in your mercies while we wait for the day when you bring all this to its end and we're with you. God, we know that life is fraught with trouble and we are going to experience pain and sadness and hardship and loss. But God, we know that whatever we face, that you are faithful. Help us always to be mindful of that, not to lose sight to beware the leaven of the Pharisees and the Sadducees and the Herods and every other faction that's out there in this world that would take us away by unbelief. But let us put our hope in you. God, you promise not only to save us, but to sustain us, not only to call us, but to keep us. And so God, help us to rest faithfully in your mercies in the days ahead. We thank you for what you've done for us in Christ. And we pray that we would know him and that we would honor him and trust him. We pray these things in his name. Amen.